Welcome back, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you want to support, you could subscribe to the newsletter for free, or you could get the stuff behind the paywall, $5 a month, aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack.com. You could also support at multiple levels at patreon.com slash toahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. Today, I am joined by the chief amongst the learned ones, Deacon Alama Salasi. Uh, <laughs> why don't you begin by introducing yourself in terms of your background, like where did you grow up and, and what parish do you cur currently serve? Um, hi, I grew up uh, in America uh, and I've had the opportunity to study the traditional uh, Ethiopian teachings uh, abroad in Ethiopia uh, on several occasions on uh, in several different times. Uh, now I serve in um, DC at uh, St. Mary's Bazurat Layam Tigeno, or the St. Mary's that's in transition. Um, it's a small parish in DC and I serve there currently. Beautiful. Just to, to give people a picture, we won't deep dive on it because today we want to get into an article that you recently wrote and talked about. And you'll see uh, Deacon Alama Salasi will be a, a frequent guest on this program. Hopefully he's got a, a book uh, potentially in the works and I'm sure we can bug him to come back on the program for, for multiple issues. But for now, just briefly about your the two kind of periods that you spent in Ethiopia, what were you focusing on the first time and, and what were you focusing on the second time? <clears throat> the first time uh, I was uh, focusing on the uh, Giz reading and that's, that's usually practiced through a, a reading of the Psalms. Uh, it, for those who don't know, Giz reading is very particular pronunciations, uh, uh, dictate meanings, um, and so usually the way the the in in the traditional schools the way reading is taught is through uh, mainly but not only uh, it's through the Psalms and uh, so I it, I had been studying that and um, the uh, liturgical chants Kadasi uh, I was I was kind of simultaneously in both. Uh, when I had when I had first gone in 2000, in 1999, I had already been a, a, a bit familiar with um, uh, the chanting and and the reading. I had been initiated into it uh, to a, to a, to a lesser extent. And then when I went to Ethiopia, I, I studied at a at Zoi uh, a monastery and. Um, you know, with in, in the whole traditional style where you have, you sit with the teacher and everyone sits under a tree and you have, you have different one of it or different chairs. Uh, the main, the main one that the teacher teaches and then uh, rotational groups of students. And I think there may have been maybe 50, 50 students that were, learning reading and then 50 that were learning Kandasi. And, and that was my first, um, that was my first trip. The second time around was many years later, maybe a decade later. And uh, that was at Baata, Baata Mariam. Um, and uh, that time it was- um, in, in Addis Ababa, right? Not to be confused with the one in, in Gwandar? Not to be confused with the one in Gwandar. It's the one in Addis Ababa. Um, both are both are centers of learning in the Ethiopian church, very renowned centers of learning. <clears throat> and uh, at Bata, my uh, main focus was primarily Agwagwam, which is a form of, uh, it's a more modern form of chant. It's a medieval, uh, as where the original chant is uh, rooted in uh, antiquity. Um, so it was established by, you know, by the seventh century, the, and, and so the Agwagam is a more medieval and a slightly newer, more elaborate form of chant. Uh, and, and that was 
well, what I had um, that that was the uh, school I had joined when I had when I was gone when I had gone to Ethiopia, Agogon Bit, as they say, is the school, the house of Agogon. Yeah, I, I want to, we're, we're going to have to deep dive on Akwakwa maybe on another episode, but maybe kind of uh, briefly before we, we get into the main topic of, of today, when you were going to learn Akwakwa at Ba'ata, um, I know there are a few different styles. Um, I I think there's, right, there's Takle, there's Gwander, there's Beta Mariam. So I've, I, I've at least heard of like three styles. I don't know if there are are more than that. Do you do you learn anything about like the differences between the styles or do you just like go to the like or is it just like one mode of aquaquam that's being taught at, at any given time? At at <clears throat> at Bata the aquaquam is uh is beta mariam uh which is it's a particular combination of of gonder tachvit and then the the staff the 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 uh the staff, the uh, the chanting that's done with this staff or the zimmami is um, tekli, uh, and that has a, a more um, involved movement and it's a more elaborate chant. Um, and then you have other, you know, you have other. Uh, there's laibit sanasid, which is very different. It, it for me, I, I've heard it and it, it was significantly different enough that I couldn't sing along. Wow. And and that was I had heard, I believe, Live It's Anasil right next door to Baata at, at Gibbi Gabriel. Uh I, I had heard that was that's the only place I think I've heard it. And so yeah, there are different styles. No one will necessarily indoctrinate you into it, but you it's kind of known and you know it's it's kind of just Im implicit and uh, you can ask around and people, you know, will, will inform you. Yeah. From, from what I understand and I understand very little, it's like the words are typically the same very rarely. I mean, you'll have the normal difference between manuscripts and, you know, a lot of that has to do with how old the particular manuscript is, but like you're saying, the movements of the sistrum, the sanazel, and the movements of the staff in the choreography of this uh, non-Eucharistic liturgy, which is, you know, chanted any time between like 8 p.m. and 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 5 a.m. on on most of the the big feast days, uh, that's where the kind of the differentiation is. That's that's cool to to think about how diverse the church is, and yet still how how united it is. And while we're on the topic of of unity, looking outside of just the the good is right context or you know Ethiopia and Eritrea which obviously have the same tradition um, and the same traditions plural as we're mentioning you've been involved recently with the Oriental Orthodox solidarity project can you tell us a little bit about that yeah um, so <clears throat> it's um, it's an attempt to um, uh, um, create a dialogue here in the west of social of social justice uh, and from the uh you know obviously from the oriental orthodox uh, c communities um which are you know the the in addition to the tawahado right it's the armenian um the malankara and the um others the coptic uh right and and so on and um we uh so it's it's also for me in in my thought it's particularly uh, uh, an attempt to look back at uh, maybe even the stance of the Ethiopian Church towards America in like the eighties where um, or before where you had um, where you had a missionary uh, approach towards um, the uh, Black American communities in in the West, and you, you know that as uh, as you're familiar with the church in uh, Long Beach and and New York and the mission in the to the Caribbean and and so on. Um, so it's it's kind of an attempt to look back at that period uh, because I think the past twenty or so years has been a um, 
the focus has been in internal and people like us, you and I, we grow up in the church and, and then we become adults and, you know, it's still, it's still kind of, it, it doesn't blossom into, <clears throat> it has not blossomed into what we might have expected. There's sometimes a backward movement. And, and, and I've seen a lot of that backward movement myself. And so it's just my, <clears throat> my uh, engagement is a attempt to look back at that, at that period and pick up where things had left off necessarily from there. <clears throat> I mean, um, one, one, one example is English services where people are actually having these debates. Well, they had English services back in the 90s, but now you have, you have to convince people who believe, you know, that they're conservative and that they're preserving the, the, the church tradition and so on. <clears throat> um, from our perspective, like you and I, we don't mind having a complete is service, uh, it, but the reality is you have a population in the West that uh, might not be able to engage in that. Although there are some that can, <clears throat> and there are a lot of uh, traditional teachers here that are equipping the church now to be able to stick to the original is right, and that's great. Uh, but returning to the uh, Solidarity Project point, it's a attempt to <clears throat> look back at that period where the where the church was engaged in communities outside of itself. Uh, and, and it always has, there has always been periods. For example, in the 12th century, the church had been engaging towards communities outside of the highlands, like the, the legacy of Avunetak the Haimanot is the legacy of uh, spreading the faith, the Orthodox faith to the rest of everyone else and, and to, move, to move the message forward, sometimes to peoples that were um, rather, uh, uh, they're, you know, uh, practicing in witchcraft and um, uh, th things of that sort. So it was kind of, you know, you want to use politically correct language, so I'm being careful, but it was um, to civilize to a certain extent. Um, and, and with that, you know, came <clears throat> the uh, literary tradition, which we're going to talk about real quick also but that's yeah it's the fascinating what you said about the pseudo conservatism whenever somebody uses a word like conservative you got to ask the question what what are you conserving you know are you per like you said it, it existed in the 90s in la it was in the 70s in in trinidad and tobago it was there in 1952 english language services so it's like are you conserving the 2000s in Addis Ababa and that maybe like your section of Addis Ababa, like what, what you personally know and not something that's even like written down somewhere from one of these certification houses that we're talking about, but that, you know, maybe led by one kind of charismatic Sunday school leader or maybe a group of charismatic <laughs> Sunday school leaders. I think, I think they, they believe they're conserving a, a, a certain like medieval because their their worldview is obviously uh, informed by uh, the Ged, the hagiographies, and so uh, you know you see a transformation in how people dress uh, in a very conservative manner. I mean, you and I have, <laughs> you know, excuse the garb, but you and I are both uh, in in. Um, traditional, a quote unquote traditional attire. But um, so the question of what are they preserving? Yeah, because uh, is it Addis Ababa in the 90s, in the 80s? Or is it, because um, it doesn't look like it. It looks like the idea the, the, of, of being conservative is is kind of reaching back to some slightly imagined history, but that's informed by some of the church's literature is what it seems like. Yeah, you and I could be wearing cassocks very easily. We're both teachers in the church, both deacons. Um, you know, personally, aesthetically, I prefer the netala or the netala gabi or the gabi. 
uh, itself, you know, traditional things like the kabba and the temtem, the, the head wrap and the cape. I think there's a certain majesty and aesthetic appeal, but it's very subjective on, on my part. And it's not an issue of, of dogma, but then it gets interesting, you know, like what we personally, how we personally want to dress versus the imposition of, of certain dress codes on other I'm, people. I'm actually not wearing a natala. I'm wearing a, a Abu Jadi. And that is, um, this is what, what I took from my teacher when I left the monastery in uh, 2000, uh, kind of in, uh, in the way Elijah asked for, uh, Alicia asked for his teacher's garb. Uh, you know, you walk away with, uh, hopefully, if your teacher likes you enough, but this is not even really, you know, this is a m monastic uh, garb, but it could pass, you know, it's, 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 it looks the same. Yeah, the color blends in and there's a sense in which um, some people simplify it too much, but like, this is the garb of the rural Ethiopian. And so it's, it's simple, but it's like a simple yet elegant way. But in the I prefer the word Afro-Asiatic, but anyway, they refer to themselves, uh, you all, as the Oriental Orthodox Solidarity Project. And in that project, I know there's a forthcoming website and a forthcoming publication. Um, and I know you, you've you been working on a, on a piece recently that should be published there. Can you tell us the the title of that piece and what the general kind of theme or what it is you're you're trying to say with this piece? The theme is um, <clears throat> the theme is to examine the point of uh, of of the human dignity as opposed to the definition of human uh, of the human person that's given by rulers and uh, uh, those, who, those who find themselves in at the higher levels of society. For example, the points I, the, the, the main points I bring up are, um, are biblical points and it's the uh, Torah. Uh, and I know you'll like this because you're, cause you're um, a student of Hebrew. Um, it's the Torah and how, it how the Torah speaks uh, into the community, a message of human dignity. Initially, that's the first story. It's it's the it's it's the Genesis story, and it speaks about human dignity, and that was opposed to ancient Near Eastern civilizations. That you know, they said the rulers are um, <clears throat> Pharaoh is uh, the son of whatever uh, god, and um, uh, ba the Babylonian rulers are. The uh, descendants of so and so uh, God and other people don't matter, and um, the Torah is a contradiction of this, and and um, uh, and then the prophets themselves they continued this tradition that was very contrarian to um, to even their own rulers that were. You know, this is already a, na a, a a nation of a nation that worships the one true God. So they're even during the time of the prophets, uh, uh, they are speaking out against their own governments who are anointed by God. Although the point is, no no ruling system is perfect, and uh, the bit this uh, the biblical truth is that human dignity and the human value. And, the, and and who who the person is the human person humanity who that is comes it comes from uh revelation like the value is spoken through revelation it and so i also bring up a modern point of um uh, during modern times of this same kind of revolution in the 1950s where uh the the definition changed because you know societies thought that they had advanced and uh, they defined human beings in a in a way that was suitable for a different cause and you know this was informed by Darwinism Marxism etc cetera, etc cetera. and it came it found its way of course to 
uh, Ethiopia. And the point is of the article is to speak about to speak about the um, how the message of scripture and the tradition of the church are in contradiction to the world, no matter what. Uh, they, the, their values are loftier. And um, Abuna, Abuna uh, Petros is an example of the martyr, the Ethiopian martyr, who uh, he just couldn't swallow <clears throat> the, um, the indignity to the human being uh, and uh, that uh, came th came through th the ideologies, these new ideologies, and so, um, and also the the centerpiece is all, all, the the center the the core nucleus is also Saint Yarid to uh, using his hym hymnography to uh, uh, ad address you know our theology is usually musical, um, not always, but we're very Semitic and our theology is encapsulated in our liturgical music, in our liturgical and in the there's a lot of it. And so um, I also, while bringing up these points, wanted to use our own uh, and make our own uh, speak to these points. And so these are the, the, these are essentially the points that I um, brought up and uh, they 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 the argument, the, the the discussion is rooted in uh, an examination of a very brief and, and accessible examination of um, the Torah, the prophets, and uh, the modern witness to this this uh, loftier point of uh, who the human person is, and as opposed to rulers and and the systems that rule, which. You know that may be depending on where you are. It may be the ancient Near East. It may be um, in the 1950s. It may be whatever. Uh, util uh, uh, um, what is it? Um, the, any of the, the modern political um, systems, or even it could be even now where we find ourselves. Some people are. Um, you know, some people say we're Christians and we support the government 100 percent and. Um, some people, you know, don't, and, and so without getting into any politics, I don't get into any politics, um, trying to look at where we derive our understanding of the human value and to understand that no matter what, it's always going to be in contra contrary to, to those that rule over us. Well said, yeah, people don't like to be bound. And what the living God did is he, he made a book, he made a scroll, and in that scroll we have the Torah and the Nephavim, the instruction or the teaching and the prophets, as you said, which is a critique of the nations, of the peoples, of the Gentiles. At the same time, it's a critique of the, the authors and editors themselves. It's a critique of the nation. It's a critique of the people. It's a critique of, of Israel, um, you know, and obviously we as the church view ourselves as as in continuity if not biologically spiritually with the israel of scripture with the 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 person who is contending with god sometimes i humorously translate israel he who does jujitsu with god uh, that's a personal thing you know but it's it's contending it's it's struggling it's grappling and it's it's not uh, about a physical insurrection, otherwise we'd be zealots, and we would have been crushed in the the insurrection in Jerusalem in 70 AD. But it is this this contending, like you said, with the systems, with the rules, with the this critique of of the leaders, of those who are abusing power by abusing the least of these, my brethren, by not showing the dignity of the human being. And like you said, it's in contrast to the various witchcrafts, to the various pagan cults and religions of the past. It's so fascinating. There's an atheist historian, Tom Holland. It's one of my favorite follows on Twitter. And in his writing, he discovered the stark difference between pagan Rome and, and later Christian Rome. And he said, my God, even though I don't believe, he's almost like saying to God in prayer, help my unbelief. And that is because he saw just the wanton abuse, the lack of dignity that human beings have under paganism. And his fear is that 
from the enlightenment to the present moment, as the world has been growing more and more secular, that as it tosses organized religion aside, it's going to begin emulating those older pagan cults and religions. We see that, like you said, in fascist Italy, in Stalinist Russia, in uh, you know Marxist-Leninist uh, Russia, the USSR. We saw it during communism in Ethiopia. We saw it with obviously you know the the rule of the internet is you have to bring up Hitler and fascist Germany, right? So we see it in in what happens when you replace organized religion with uh, something else. Like it leaves a vacuum, and what is plugged in that vacuum is is sometimes uh, very like you know much worse. It, without delving too much into it, just because it affected us Christians uh, in terms of like foreign policy on a very basic you know note, you can justify it or not after. But a very basic note to be said is like Saddam Hussein was seen as this crazy man. He took his own blood and made a Quran written in his own blood. He did a lot of crazy things, but he was generally a secular-ish Muslim. And who does he get replaced with when he's knocked off? ISIS or Daesh. Uh, and so, again, like all the geopolitics surrounding it, we could put it aside. But when we ask ourselves from the frame that you set, it sounds silly, but was human dignity protected more under Saddam Hussein or under Daesh? And then, you know, if it is Saddam Hussein, which I think most people would agree on, it's like, well, is that the peak of human dignity? How can we keep elevating and raising this idea? How can we, we progress? It goes back to what we were saying about conservatism earlier. I think the church is neither conservative nor progressive, but rather traditional and radical. It has to have this, this apostolic deposit this timeless truth that's unchanging, protecting the dignity of the human being. At the same time, it has to be radical in adopting it. Like you, you mentioned Qaddus Yared, and we're going to get into him. I'm, I'm so glad you, you said that. Like a point that we can make to the pseudo conservatives is this. If the Alexandrians or the Antiochans wanted to impose upon us and have a hyper conservatism or pseudo conservatism at their time, then our liturgical language would have remained Greek or it would have been Syriac. We would have all our hymnography in either Syriac or Greek. And later in the medieval times, you know, the Copts switch over to the Coptic language kind of retroactively. Maybe then we would switch to Coptic. But instead, they didn't impose that on us. They presented us with authentic Christianity and allowed it to bloom. And we had the unique situation where um, because of, you know, so many reasons that could be detailed somewhere else in Ethiopia, different than all our, everyone else in our communion was dominated at one point militarily. But in Ethiopia, Orthodox Christianity, Afro-Asiatic Orthodox Christianity was the dominant religion. And so it allowed the musical tradition to flourish in arguably more elaborate ways. And so Holy Jared of Aksum or the Aksumite is credited with, depending on how you, you count it, three to four books one of those books is called Zimmare, which you know means like a psalmody or a hymnography. And it's primarily a book of communion songs, although that makes it sound so simple. And there's a, a preaching within those communion songs. You quoted this in, in your article. Could you maybe read and, and sing for us uh, this kind of excerpt? from Zimmari, which is one of the, the books of Holy Jared the Aksumite, which is still, I have to say, sadly still not translated into Amharic, let alone English in its entirety. There's just too much of it. Uh, no one has, has begun that. No one has begun that work. And um, even, you know, even us in our, in our discussion now um, or in, in the dialogue that's happening or that will hopefully ha begin and continue, we um, have to use uh, our own tradition to speak to now. Um, uh, there's an interesting uh, 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 analogy with St. Yare to St. Ephraim, a Syrian who uh, uh, is, is a great poet and is, is, un is now acknowledged as, as being a great poet. Um, but for so long, his work was overlooked by Western academics because they were like, 
it didn't fit their mold. And just like Ephraim, St. Yarid is, is, is a poet. And so uh, the, the things that Yarid says, there's great depth to it. It's Semitic though. So if you're looking at it from a perspective of like these, what the, like a very, um, like through the heritage of, 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 of Greek learning on which modern educa education is based, you're gonna easily overlook, and, and we've overlooked the value of the work and we have seen this happen with St. Ephraim and it was, you know, just, it has not been very long since St. Ephraim has been acknowledged and studied by, um, who, who is it, uh, the Oxford Orientalist? Sebastian Brock. Sebastian Brock. Now everybody knows that Ephraim is this great poet. Well, you know, people of the Syrian church knew and, and, and the Ethiopian church knew and other Orthodox traditions may have known, but in the West, it was just over, his work was overlooked because it was written in a Semitic style. And they, they emphasize, uh, like you said, Greek philosophy and then the Latin writers and later the Anglo-Saxon, the English and the German writers, hyper-rationalism. So everything that they present is to argue with someone about doctrine, whereas Ephraim's goal is to teach the people, to instruct the people how to live through song. And to explore um, their mystics, to explore the divine, the divine realities through poetry, to engage in the divine realities, not to speak on them argumentatively, but rather to engage in them. Um, and if I can share, we can, we can look at the, um, the quote I used for the article, which was, it was a very simple quote showing the unity between the uh, Torah and the prophets. But the point, the point was I wanted that uh, cohesiveness to be spoken by uh, someone from our own tradition, uh, a, a um, theologian from our own tradition. An authentic African expression of Christianity. I had some Trinidadi brothers on and they, they were seeking that very thing. Uh, it made a technology. It's there. Do you, do you see it? Itayenyal. We'll see if it shows up in the recording. Gunitayenyal in Mokarosti. Okay. So the, the uh, quote is, is, is that I used was, um, was the line in this, in this very long verse uh, that, that mentions that this is the message of Moses and this is what Isaiah prophesied through prophecy. But beyond just the quote, as you can see here, hopefully later it, it'll be visible in the recording, is that this is a, um, this is a musical composition and you see the letters and you see the musical notation. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna chant this real quick so that um, we can engage it in, in its, uh, with the reverence due to it. No la we home Isra El Thank 
ከመይማ ጸወልድ በስብሃት ናምን ህላዊሁ ዘሰበኩ ዘሰበከ ዘሰበከ ሙሴ በኦሪት ወኢሳኢያስ ነገረ በትንቢት ናምን ህላዊሁ and it goes on and it's rather long but up that is from the beginning of of that of of that song which is sung on a particular sunday from the beginning unto the point where i where i quoted saint yared saying that this this message this unified message is the message of the um of the uh, of moses and the prophets which is a teach which is what the core teaching of Christ Christ taught from the Torah and the prophets but this is also as as um verbalized and and um sung and poetically it, it engaged in uh via the uh hymnities of of Saint Yared Zimare Yared kahen ya samallen may god have you hear the melodies of Jared the priest of Aksum. Yeah, there there's so many themes in there. Obviously, like you said it's lengthy, so we're not going to touch on everything, but a couple of the things that stuck out to me is a point that I know you and I are both fans of the leading biblical scholar in the Orthodox world who always puts the semetic mindset at the forefront. That is Father Paul Nadim Tarazi. He talks about one of the greatest motifs or themes of scripture is shepherdism. And so right there Nolawihomu, the shepherd of Israel, come and, and raise your power and, and save us, rescue us. That's kind of the beginning theme there. Um, and so, you know, he has this statement that he says that always cracks me up. He's like, if he's a shepherd, that makes us a sheep. And all the sheep has to say is ba. And so, you know, it's, uh, it kind of echoes what we learn from the Desert Fathers is sometimes we talk too much. It's just a funny thing for a podcaster to say. But we need to to listen with our ears to the the liturgies of the church, to the scripture when it is read aloud in the church, like the Psalms of David that you grew up learning in in Zuai Monastery in southern Ethiopia. We need to listen to the voice of the church, which represents the voice of the living God. And when we follow that voice of the shepherd, then we are receiving the salvation the deliverance and and the rescue from from the shepherd were were there any other kind of uh points in there that that stuck out to you from the zimari uh i mean there are a lot of it's 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 heavily theological it, it, i mean um even what you just said the shepherd of israel raise up your power ah ah ah, 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 ah. that's how that's how he expressed you know raise up your power the um it's doc it, it, i mean it's it's doctrinally um centered here naam min hilawihu we believe in how would you translate that? His his being, his essence. His being. Uh, this is where some of the trouble comes. On on certain words like that, they get hard to translate. But yeah, it comes, yeah. you know, from halot. So like from being, existence, being. life, you know, all that. It 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 it. It's reminiscent of um, the uh, Nicene Creed, salota haimanot, and. The um, the song itself is split up into many of ma ma many of these short short statements. Um, uh, 
ዚክየ ወእቱ ዘሰበከን ዘሰበኩ ነቢያት this is this is he who the prophets spoke of that he would come in glory kama yimatsu the world of subhat uh and then you know we believe in his being and then this is he who the pro- who moses spoke of we believe in his being um and so on so the end at the very end of this him the 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 final the final the final statement is um to christ whose rule will not be um how would you translate that destroyed ending yeah and it's, it's, it's again it's, echoing the the nicene creed like you said but 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 some of the words they just like halawi will cannot be existence halawi would be being um mangistu ya maishar mangistu it would be his indestructible kingdom his invincible kingdom yeah so yeah, it, it it's it's reminiscent of the uh creed which was originally a, a greek statement but it's also this is a semitic expression and th- there's always care that needs to be taken when bringing uh, uh bringing that language into a uh a, a western um any west any western language it seems yeah it's deeply it's interesting like you said he's talking about moses and the prophets which is this language that we hear in the new testament but it's also you know it's about the older testament the hebrew bible but it's hyper christocentric we said in the beginning that these are communion hymns so what you just saying would be sung as people are receiving the the body of christ and the they're 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 receiving the flesh and the blood of christ in the elements of the wine and the bread and so while people are receiving this this is being sung and the idea is to to get people when they hear anything from genesis exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy when they hear anything from the minor prophets or the major prophets to look out and realize that there is as you said from the semitic interpretation of scripture which is preserved you know in in many forms of judaism and and in the syriac and aramaic and hebrew traditions there is a historic interpretation an original kind of layer of interpretation but as we know from our tergwame bait you know when there's one meaning they say bo when there are multiple meanings they say andim to the point where you know the tradition is itself called the andimta and one more meaning or and it also means this so that the kind of greater fulfillment or the final fulfillment of a lot of the things we find in Moses and the prophets is this christocentric world view like like you mentioned the coming the coming of the sun to to save us to rescue us and to deliver us yeah and and to to the to the continued point of of its like semitic centeredness um isma wetu exia la sanwat namen hallawu because he is the lord of the sabbath it's uh, it and that's that's put there as as one particular statement in between the we believe in his being and this is also a sunday this is this is particularly would have been on a sunday because it it mentions that the um it has it it has it listed as a sunday as a sunday hymn that's right in our tradition there was much ado in the medieval times they did a whole uh, episode actually with my brother Chris aka Hafta Salasi about some of these medieval controversies about celebrating two sabbaths uh, putting that aside because those parties were reconciled the saturday is, is known as qadam or sanbat qadami or qadami sanbat which is the first sabbath but sunday is the chief sabbath for saint yared 
and that is Sanvata Christian or the Sabbath of Christians. And so you're you're exactly right. Someone could try to take that Sabbath line out of context, but when you look at the context of the text that you just sang for us so beautifully, the context is with weld, with the sun. And so it's uh it's again, it's all Christocentric, it's Semitic, but it's got uh, a shout out and homage to the the Greek roots. There's a Greco Semitic conversation going on in our tradition. And our tradition, as I said, has been Alexandrian and, and Antiochian. It's been Greek and it's been Syriac from, from the very beginning. At the same time, we have our own authentic ways of expressing it with our own melodies that we developed and in our own language, the So that's, that's amazing. If you, if you have any kind of a final or concluding remarks, I think this will be a good preview. So I, I hope they read your article when it comes out in the Oriental Orthodox Solidarity Project. And yeah, if you have any concluding remarks or, or final thoughts you want to share about any of the subjects we covered, other than that, we're gonna we're gonna keep uh, calling on you to to come back as a repeat guest. Yeah, thanks. No, uh, you did. You know, your your sum summary was perfect. I don't have anything to add to that. Sunday, Sunday. Thank you. Thank you.